Okay. Thank you, everybody, to come here, considering the um, ridiculous uh, problem that we have here. This week, we are hosting uh, Nina Papadomano Lucky. I say it right. Thank yes. you, Nina. <laughs> from University of Munster in Germany. She is half Greek and half Dutch, born and raised in Greece. She obtained her BSc, Master and PhD title from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Her first postdoc was in Serege in Aix-en-Provence in France. Through her research, she has focused on the causes of marine deoxygenation through time and the interaction of this process with the carbon cycle as a negative feedback carbon, um, carbon sink. She combines proxy data, generation analysis with numerical modeling, which has been her tool for choice for the last years. And today she is going to talk about deoxygenation in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. So Nina, uh, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for trying so hard to get everything to work. I hope the presentation is worth it. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the loss of oxygen from the ocean during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras, with specific focus on a number of events that we can use as potential analogs for uh, future climate change and future um, deoxygenation in the ocean. I'm going to start with a brief overview over what the situation is like for the oxygen in the current ocean, and then we're going to move back in time and specifically look at potential causes and interactions between carbon cycle perturbations and loss of oxygen from the ocean. Let's see, yes, that works. Okay, so in the open ocean, we've been losing oxygen for a number of decades now, at least from the 1950s, although potentially longer, depending on how far back certain records go. And already in a natural situation, there are parts of the ocean where oxygen is a lot lower than uh, what may be good for, let's say, larger organisms. So these are called oxygen minima zones, and they usually occur in areas where upwelling fuels a lot of productivity and where certain currents bring less oxygen or more oxygen and you get all kinds of interactions. And these areas are marked in this map by these black solid lines. So you've got one in basically each basin. You've got the Arabian Sea, OMZ, and the Bay of Bengal, and then the Pacific and the Atlantic, OMZ. Um, but in many areas you see here in red, oxygen has been declining. So this is a change uh, per decade. And this is very well correlated with heat content. So that tells us already that it is linked to uh, climate change and changes in temperature, which both uh, may decrease the solubility of oxygen. So basically the ocean takes up less oxygen from the atmosphere. And we also have increased stratification, which means that deeper layers don't mix as much with the surface layer and therefore oxygen doesn't travel down into the water column as much as it normally does. And this is the current pattern, but we are expecting this to worsen in the future uh, if we don't change what we are doing. And then it's not just the open ocean, it's also the coastal ocean. So all these red dots that you see on the map are specific locations where we have found hypoxic conditions. So hypoxia is usually determined by whether larger organisms can survive in a certain area or if oxygen is too low for that. And whereas in the open ocean, it's mostly temperature that's determining the loss of oxygen in the coastal waters, it's actually nutrient enrichment. So you've got a lot of fertilizer coming in from uh, land, from agricultural land. We've got sewage coming in from the cities and also combustion of fossil fuels releases certain nutrients. In particular, nitrogen and phosphorus are the most important. And when you have a lot of nutrients, you have a lot of organic matter that's produced in the surface layer. And when it's decomposed deeper in the water column, this consumes oxygen. So if there's more organic matter decomposition, you have more oxygen loss and you can end up with hypoxic waters like in these areas. And this can also then influence uh, feedbacks. So for example, phosphorus, one of these two nutrients is usually buried in sediments. But when oxygen is very low, the buried phosphorus can be remobilized and re-enter the water column and fuel even more uh, productivity. Now, not every part of the coastal ocean is equally susceptible. It also depends on circulation patterns and how it's connected to the open ocean. So, for example, the Baltic Sea has a huge hypoxic area, 
which is also controlled by influx of water from the North Sea, but also a lot by this feedback and by the input of fertilizer. Um, so based on these trends and also some model simulations, we expect this to continue. And in the coastal area, we're going to see interplay also between heating and nutrient input. So the situation is gonna get even worse, but we obviously don't know what climate's going to be like in 100 or 200 or 300 years. And for this, we have all these different uh, scenarios that we put into climate models to see what happens to atmospheric CO2 and to temperatures. And we've got a range of possible future states. The bottom one is what we call the best case scenario. So if we stop relatively quickly now with uh, emitting carbon, this is the best case. If we go in the worst case scenario, the red one, in which case we start emitting even more than we are doing at the moment, we end up with a very warm world and probably very low oxygen. Now, to, un to have an idea of just how bad it can get in the ocean, we have to look to climate states that were kind of similar to what we expect. And for this, we have to go very far in the past. So if you look at the time scale here at the bottom, we are basically in the modern era, going back hundreds of thousands of years, now we're going millions of years. And especially for the early Eocene, we're going tens of millions of years in the past to end up with a climate state that looks a bit like what we expect. And uh, for my work, I actually also go further back in time. And uh, these are the three big events that I have worked on. So all three of those were periods in climate history, in Earth history, where climate was a lot warmer. So we have climate change. There is a, a perturbation of the carbon cycle, just like we have now. There is more CO2 or methane added to the atmosphere. And we find these intervals where there's very high organic carbon deposited, which is linked usually to low oxygen. And um, we can sort of investigate how big a part of the ocean lost oxygen. So the oldest interval is the Toarshan Oceanic Anoxic event in the Jurassic 183 million years ago. Then we've got Oceanic Anoxic event 2 94 million years ago in the Cretaceous. And then PTM is the most recent one. Uh, it's 56 million years ago, so still quite a long time ago. And these values that you see here are the molybdenum isotope value of seawater. And lower values mean that large parts of the ocean uh, did not have oxygen, but free sulfide, which is pretty extreme. So these two events probably were much more extreme in terms of deoxygenation than the PTM. But even the PTM was already worse than what we have in the modern ocean. So this is a potential analog for the future. And these two are really extreme scenarios that help us test uh, certain scenarios for the future, but also just mechanisms. So um, this is kind of the reason why we work on such old events is basically we can learn something about how the ocean reacts to different situations. So first of all, does the reaction depend on the background state? So I'm going to talk a lot about geography, but also does it matter, for example, if you are increasing CO2 in a cold world or a warm world? These kind of things have been tested and they definitely show an impact. Then, of course, the forcing itself, we are emitting quite a lot of carbon quite fast nowadays. But if you emit more, do you also get more deoxygenation? How does that work? And the last one, I'm not going to talk about too much, but it's these feedbacks that sort of strengthen the original forcing, like the recycling of phosphorus. So you first have an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, you warm the planet, you start losing oxygen, but then you have extra processes that make the situation even worse. And then from all of these things, we can sort of test the output that we get from models for the future and see, are we missing some mechanisms? Are we not really representing the ocean as it should be? Is the sensitivity right? Are we getting too much deoxygenation or too little? And a lot of this is checked by looking at past events. So I'm gonna go straight into the first topic. So that is background and conditions and how geography impacts uh, the spread of low oxygen conditions with the Toarshan. So the first time the Toarshan was recognized, basically they found high organic carbon content and a lot of different locations. And they were they 
basically concluded, okay, so we have an event of global anoxia and this leads to black shale formation. Um, and this is what it looks like in the field. I have not seen it in the field myself, unfortunately, but you get these really black layers with high organic carbon content at multiple locations. And there are a number of compilations. So all the, the dots here represent different contents of organic carbon found in different locations. And there's a zoom in here in the Northwestern European Sea, which is where we find most proof for low uh, oxygen, let's say. So there's some here at the edge of South America, North America, a bit of the Arctic, but most is here in Europe. So this kind of calls into question the, the global part of the first sentence. Is it really global anoxia? So this is a slightly more up-to-date uh, compilation for that same Northwest European Seaway. So all the black and dark gray is very high organic carbon content. And then in the South, you have more light gray and white symbols, which mean organic content is not very high. And this also correlates with other proxies that we have that show that here we really have no oxygen and even free sulfide in the water column. And in the South, everything seems to be more or less oxic. So while we may have a sort of global signal, which was an excursion in carbon isotopes, which I will show later, uh, this hints at a global perturbation, but the spread of anoxia may also be due to local factors and is much more geographically constrained in this one area, as far as we know. Um, just a small note that I do need to make is that we also just don't have a lot of locations outside of Europe because we're talking about an event that's so old, a lot of this oceanic crust is already gone and we're dependent on outcrops. So there may be a bias of that in the data. So, um, yeah, okay, it doesn't show all the figures as it should, but anyway, um, we use models to see how geography impacts circulation. So there are different geographical uh, reconstructions that we can use and also different models because they will all have slightly different results. And it's important to remember that these are experiments. So we are not simulating the real world. We, we're missing a lot of information. So we're using the best information that we have to see what kind of results will come out of that. So these are two different models using the same uh, reconstruction of where the continents would be and how deep the ocean floor is. And we see that there's a very large current going uh, from east to west along the equator. And a small part of that breaks off and goes into that northwest uh, European seaway. And it's a bit clearer in the MIT model. You see that in the southern parts and also the western parts, this current is still quite strong. But then in the area where we find low oxygen, it's very, very weak. And here we have all kinds of islands and bathymetric highs. There's some sills that are blocking deep currents. So this is potentially one of the reasons why we see low oxygen in this region. To make that a little bit clearer, we have a schematic that we made. So this is that very strong current uh, that goes along the equator uh, through the Hispanic corridor and a part of it breaks off to go into here. And here, because of all these islands that we have, um, the flow is restricted, so less oxygen is brought in from the open ocean into these waters. And that's partly the reason why they become uh, anoxic or even euxinic. And then additionally, we see also in our simulations and also based on some data that we have from the locations, potentially some fresh waters are coming in from the Arctic Ocean and stratifying the water column. So again, miss the mixing between surface and deep waters is inhibited, and this can then make it even worse and there's more oxygen loss. So this is one potential uh, time period where we see that the geography is a very key constraint on where you do or do not get anoxic conditions. Then uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about the other two intervals. So OE2 and the PTM. OE2 is the one at the bottom and the PTM is the one on the top. And the black dots basically tell you where you find black shales. So where you find very high organic carbon content. And it's clear straight away that in the PTM, it's really restricted again to the Peritethys area, uh, area here on, in Europe, Northern Europe, the Arctic. And then if you look at OE2, it's all over the Atlantic and we've got really deep sides, we've got really shallow sides. They're here in the Western interior seaway. They're on Europe, it's much more spread out. 
So this then begs the question, what's the difference between these two? Why do we get so much more organic carbon deposition here and presumably low oxygen compared to the PTM? One of the reasons might be geography. If you look at it, you already see it's not entirely the same, especially in this Atlantic basin where a lot of the uh, black shales are deposited. So I, um, we know from isotopic systems like the molybdenum that I already mentioned, but also sulfur isotopes and uranium isotopes that OE2 is a much more extreme event than the PTM. And one of the things that we are wondering is what is the ocean like before the event? So are we starting from a already deoxygenated state? Is the Atlantic already very low in oxygen before OE2? What's it like before the PTM? Is there a big difference there? And that makes OA2 world more susceptible if you get climate change on top of it. So this is really the geography part of the question. And I used the French uh, model IPSL which simulates the atmosphere and the ocean and interactions between them. So on the left is the world before OE2. So that's the 90 million years one. And on the right is uh, 60 million years. And what you're looking at is basically oxygen concentrations in the Atlantic Ocean from the surface at the top uh, to the bottom of the ocean. And then here is north and we've got south at the bottom. And at first glance, the differences are not as big as you might expect knowing how different these two events turned out to be. So in the equatorial part of the world, we've got the lowest oxygen concentration. So this is basically where it's anoxic. Then the thick dashed line shows you where hypoxia is. So this is where it's becoming quite stressful for a lot of organisms. It's quite similar, except for here in the deep central Atlantic. It's a lot deeper in the um, OA2 or the pre-OA2. But it's still not as different as you might expect. And if you would look at the figures where you can look at it from the top, so basically a horizontal plot, you would see, again, it's quite similar. And this is mostly due to, the differences are mostly due to um, the solubility of oxygen. So the OA2 world is at four times pre-industrial CO2, and this is at two times pre-industrial CO2. So here, solubility is a lot lower, and that results in this much more extended hypoxia. Now, some numbers. Uh, one of the things we look at is the extent of anoxia on the seafloor, because that is what these isotopic systems reconstruct, like molybdenum and sulfur, well, especially molybdenum and uranium. And you can see straight away that the area that's anoxic or hypoxic is much, much bigger at 90 million years. It's a huge difference, and it definitely agrees with what we know from isotopic systems. But then I decided to split it up a little bit. So if you split the ocean into two sort of depth domains and you pick the upper one, so this is all the seafloor, right? All the seafloor that is shallower than two and a half thousand meters. So it's basically surface and intermediate waters, but we're not looking at the deep ocean. You see again that uh, OA2, this area is much larger. Now, if we look at the anoxic hypoxic area in this depth interval, so shallower than two and a half thousand meters, the difference is not that big anymore. And that's what you could see in this figure is that above two and a half thousand meters, so that's here, they look quite similar. It's below that you get this extension, but above it's actually quite similar. And most of the hypoxia in from this 31.7% is located in this depth interval. So what happened is that from the uh, Cretaceous to the Cenozoic, and it actually started earlier, the Atlantic Ocean has been slowly opening and deepening. So the spreading at the uh, Central Atlantic uh, Ridge has caused it to open up. And you can see that here in the Central Atlantic, these darker blue colors are really deep seafloor. And these areas are much larger in the Eocene or the Paleocene. So that's the 60 million years time interval. And the same if you look at the Southern Atlantic and the Equatorial Atlantic, it's much more deep at 60 million years than it was at 90 million years. So what we're basically suggesting is that one of the reasons that you find this higher spread of anoxic and hypoxic seafloor at 90 million years is not necessarily because these waters were just that much lower in oxygen all the way to the deep ocean, but rather that you had much shallower seafloors reaching this OMZ like area that you see in this figure.
So if at 60 million years we had shallow receive floor, we would have ended up with a very similar result. So it's a geographical change that forces this big difference rather than a climate change or some other uh, factor like circulation per se. Now, to talk a little bit about forcing, I mentioned very briefly the carbon isotope excursions. They are sort of the fingerprint of past climate change, of past changes in the input of CO2 into the atmosphere and also the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. And all three events have one. So the Toarshan and the PTM have a negative carbon isotope excursion. For the Toarshan, it's part of a bigger positive one. And OA2 is one of the few events where values in carbon isotope increase. So we have a positive carbon isotope excursion. And what this means is that for the Toarshan and the PTM, the main signal that we are capturing is the addition of CO2 because it has a lot of uh, light carbon in it. So that will push the carbon isotopes to a more negative value. Whereas for OA2, it's the burial of carbon in marine sediments that is causing this positive carbon isotope excursion. So similar processes are active at both times, but they are active at different sort of strengths and therefore the fingerprint that we find in the sedimentary record is different. Um, there are potential sources that we are looking at for where this carbon might be coming from, the CO2 that causes climate change. Uh, volcanism, when we are talking about natural systems, is sort of the big one. Uh, what you see here are basically plots uh, correlating the age of specific climate change events. So here we have the torsion, OE2, PTM, and again here OE2. And every one of these purple bars is a large igneous province. So this is volcanism on a huge scale, like what's happening in Iceland at the moment times, I don't know, a million more than that. Um, and a lot of these happen at the same time as our deoxygenation events. So they could be part of the reason why it's happening. Especially for the torsion and the PTM, this negative carbon isotope excursion that we have suggests methane may also be active um, because it has a much more negative signal. So if you add CO2 to the atmosphere, it has a delta carbon 13 of minus five or something. Methane can go down to minus 60. So you need very little methane to get a pretty big carbon isotope excursion. This methane can come either from the large igneous provinces themselves, if you get thermogenic uh, outgassing, or from these things, they are methane clathrates, and they're basically ice with methane uh, at the bottom of the ocean. So starting with the Toarshan, uh, there are two large igneous provinces that were active at the time. We've got the Karoo large igneous province, uh, which is mostly found nowadays in Southern Africa. And then we've got the Ferrar large igneous province with sections in Antarctica and on Tasmania, particularly. Uh, these large igneous provinces, it's not like one eruption and that's it. They erupt over millions of, of years often, but there are specific time intervals where the activity is much stronger and you get much more CO2 addition. And that's what these ages represent. So when you have a lot of ages, around the same sort of time point from a lot of different sites, that is a very active period. And we've got two peaks for both of them, which sort of coincide with the Toarshan uh, event, one slightly afterwards, but especially the Karoo province, which is the big one, is more or less matching when the Toarshan happened. So it could have supplied CO2 to the atmosphere and therefore warming climate, reducing oxygen solubility, increasing weathering and putting nutrients into the system. And also, we think there were intrusions into coal seams from earlier time periods, like carboniferous coal and things like that. And this would have added both CO2 and methane to the, to the atmospheric ocean system. Now, one of the things we want to know when we look at these kind of uh, potential sources is how much carbon was added and how fast. Because we want to know, uh, basically, what kind of perturbation do you need to get the kind of oxygen deoxygenation that we find in the record? So was the forcing for the Toarshan, for example, larger than for the PTM? And is that why we see such differences in organic carbon burial and anoxia and things like that? The problem is that we use these carbon isotope excursions as one of the starting points to start working out what the size of the perturbation was and how fast carbon emissions um, were put out. 
Unfortunately, every site seems to have its own sort of carbon isotope excursion. So this is just a, a few of them. In the very beginning, we actually only had positive excursions. Then they discovered this negative one. It has different shapes. It has different durations uh, from different sites. So it's very hard to come to a single value based on just this. Doesn't mean people don't try. Uh, I've tried myself for another event. So uh, in a paper by Heimdall et al. that came out relatively recently, they used a number of excursions. They didn't take the whole range. They just picked a few that seemed to be very complete and have good age constraints on them. And this blue is basically the result of that. It's the range of carbon isotope values for the event. And then in gray, you have the CO2 change. So you've got this large increase of CO2 at the start of the negative excursion. And then they try different scenarios to sort of make these pink lines, which are the best fit scenario. And they found that you would need about 20 and a half thousand gigatons of carbon. And a gigaton is 10 to the power uh, 15 grams of carbon. It's, it's a huge mass. Uh, about half of that was probably methane, or at least in this scenario, it was methane. But at the moment, this is the best estimate that we have for how much carbon you need to cause the torsion. But a lot of things were not taken into account. So the model they use, for example, is a, is very um, focused on atmosphere and uh, geology, so weathering and things like that. But the ocean is poorly represented. So we don't have organic carbon burial. Once you add that, you probably need even more carbon to cause it. So this is a starting point, but it's still an open question. For the PTM, uh, the North Atlantic Igneous Province is the one that we think may be part of the problem. Uh, so Iceland is basically the little remnant of this large Igneous Province. And again, the timing coincides very well, and we get this large negative carbon isotope excursion, which suggests also some methane may have played a part. So these are... Um, scans of the seafloor in the northern Atlantic, and you see all these craters uh, that probably had hydrothermal venting occurring at the time of the PTM. At the same time, there were changes in the orbital configuration. So I don't know if you've learned about this, but eccentricity, obliquity, and precession are parameters that determine how much insulation comes onto Earth and how it's distributed. So at the time before the PTM, this was changing. And as a result, the ocean was warming, which may have led to these methane clathrates, those ice blocks that I showed being destabilized. So basically melting and the methane in them being released. So we've got two potential sources. Maybe it was both of them. Maybe there was also some methane from permafrost. This is all still uh, ongoing work. And for the PTM, we have a lot of estimates for how much carbon may have caused the event, uh, starting off with, if you use just methane clathrates, you would need about four and a half thousand to 7,000 if you include organic carbon burial. Volcanic CO2, you need much more because of the much lower carbon isotope signal. Mixed sources give a sort of in-between value again. We have no idea what the exact source was and in what kind of amount that source was, which is why we end up with such a range of values. So hopefully we are moving towards a place where we can use all of the mechanisms, all of the sources and sinks at the same time and come with a much more robust estimate. But we're not quite there yet. And then we've got OA2, which is sort of a special case. It has a positive carbon isotope excursion, and it coincides with not one, not two, but five potentially large igneous provinces. So these are osmium isotopes, which tell us there was a lot of magmatic activity at the time. So we know something was erupting, but we're not sure what was erupting, how much, and where. So... Uh, because it's a positive carbon isotope excursion, it mostly tells us something about organic carbon burial, and it's much harder to use to constrain emissions. Nonetheless, I tried anyway. So on the right, we have a target curve for carbon isotopes and CO2 with associated ages that I tried using um, for my sort of estimate for carbon or carbon emissions. So we are targeting the total change of three per mil. We are trying to recreate this shape, the timing relative to CO2 changes, and also the duration for each of these phases. So we have a lot of things that we try to match. If a scenario matches all of them, it's a little bit more robust than if we have a scenario that does a three per mil change, but doesn't do anything of the other things. And these curves are based on a very large compilation of data 
uh, that Lauren O'Connor made a few years ago. So these are the results. Um, on the first panel is basically the forcing that I use. So this is the volcanism. We tried a lot of different scenarios and the pink one is so far the best fit. So it starts um, increasing at the start of OE2, decreases <coughs> a little bit and then increases again. Carbon isotopes increase by about three per mil, which is good. We've got these A and B peaks and the relative timing is also correct. So a peak in carbon isotopes is a low point in CO2 and vice versa. The duration of the onset is too long. So it's not a perfect scenario. Um, this section has a good duration and this is organic carbon burial, which more or less matches the estimates that we have, which is not a lot. So it's not a perfect scenario, but it does hit a lot of the key points. So the total mass that I needed in uh, my model, at least, to create a sort of OA2 was 24,000 petagrams. So a bit more than what we needed for the Toarshin. Now, the problem is that is equivalent to a very large mass of large igneous province uh, emplacement. Um, the Caribbean plateau is the one that we usually, well, that we used to think was the main culprit. <laughs> it doesn't really coincide that well, according to the newest compilation, so maybe it's not. And this one would have a maximum mass of 4 instead of 6.8, um, which would also not be enough. And it would also mean we would need all of it at the same time, which is not very logical if you look at the spread in ages. Mm -hmm. If all of these erupted at the same time, even if it was just a fraction, maybe we would have enough, but it's a lot. So at the moment, we're not entirely sure if this kind of mass is even feasible for that time period and whether we need maybe also some methane to sort of reduce the total mass needed and still get enough CO2 increase. <clears throat> Very quickly, a little bit about the feedback that I mentioned, this is the phosphorus feedback. Um, so phosphorus is often delivered to sediments in the form of either uh, phosphorus uh, attached to iron oxides or in organic matter, but the long-term burial phase is apatite, a specific mineral. And we can track these processes in the past by using the ratio of organic carbon in the sediments over total phosphorus. <coughs> and we can see that these ratios were much higher during the events and especially during the torsion and OE2. The higher the value, the lower the burial of phosphorus and the more phosphorus is recycled. So higher values indicate a much stronger feedback. Now, Appetite formation is uh, influenced by a lot of things. One of them is the saturation index. If sediments are not saturated with respect to appetite, it cannot form. If they are saturated, it can form. It doesn't mean it will form, but it potentially can. The higher the saturation index, the more likely it is to form and often the more the faster it forms. So we tested a whole uh, range of different parameters and we found that the saturation index is very sensitive to temperature, <coughs> so it's a lot lower at higher temperatures, and also at low pH. So when you are looking at periods of climate change, when you have high temperature and low pH in the ocean, you expect lower phosphorus burial. So we think, especially during these events, something was really blocking appetite formation, and more phosphorus could recycle, and this also made these events much worse than the perturbation would have done on its own. Uh, almost wrapping up here, so just a quick comparison between the three events. OE2 has the largest extent of organic carbon burial, although Toarshan does have a global extent. Most of it happens on the European Seaway. And the same can be said for the PTM. There are some sites across the world, but most is in this same region. <laughs> Euxenia, so free sulfide, is much more prevalent in the Toarshan and during OE2 and much less during the PTM. And it seems that to create these widespread oceanic and oxygen events, you need a lot more carbon than for this more smaller uh, deoxygenation event, which is the PTM. 
That being said, these masses are still, even for the PTM, much bigger than what we have nowadays. So what does this mean for the modern ocean? Starting with the background part of the talk, so geography, the Atlantic Ocean was always the most susceptible ocean basin, and it's a lot deeper and more open nowadays. We have a lot less shallow seas compared to the past, and very importantly, we have deep water formation in the North and the South Atlantic, which means that the deep ocean has a very direct source of oxygen, something that wasn't always the case in the past. So geography does not favor such an extreme event at the moment. Emissions are much lower at the moment in total mass, but we are doing it a lot faster. So this could still mean that a lot of um, <clears throat> oxygen may be lost because it's going too fast. <clears throat> Fossil fuel reserves are the amount of fossil fuel we can easily access. So it's a lot, but it's still not in the range of the other two events. If technological advances and a continuing political climate as it is now uh, don't change things, we could emit even more and start going in the direction of emissions linked to the PTM, for example, which is not good news for especially the shallow parts of the ocean. Um, phosphorus recycling is also not happening on a very large scale at the moment. The main areas are sort of the Arabian Sea, OMZ here, and the Black Sea, which has a sulfitic deep part. And even then, we don't see these extreme values as we saw in the past. And saturation for appetite is very high in these basins, so it doesn't seem likely that they will ever become undersaturated. That being said, with warming and uh, decreasing pH, there may be more parts of the ocean where phosphorus starts recycling, which could still cause a worsening of the scenarios that we have now if this feedback was included. And um, Isolu Vakaba Baroni also looked into how much organic carbon burial we can expect based on the estimates of deoxygenation that we have for the future. And these amounts are large enough to cause a significant drawdown of CO2 on the time scale of thousands of years. So the oxygen loss in the ocean on the shorter term is definitely still going to be extensive and is going to be a problem for a lot of living organisms, though it will never become as extreme as we have seen, especially in the Mesozoic era. At the same time, on the longer term, tens to uh, hundreds of thousands of years, it will be one of the mechanisms that will determine how long our fossil fuel emissions remain in the atmosphere. So more organic carbon burial will mean less CO2 in the atmosphere, and so maybe a recovery of climate at a slightly faster pace than we could expect otherwise. So thank you very much for again for inviting me and for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. Do you hear us? Yes. Okay, so here you have uh, an audience of uh, 15, 20 people, by the way. Okay. <laughs> virtually. So we do have questions here. Um, let's see if you can from there, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. It was very nice talk. And the research work I'm also planning to do with the Nicholas after some times. So, my question is that uh, you were showing that uh, somewhere you were uh, linking the volcanism and development of, of the anoxic events. So, my question is that, and I'm curious to understand whether it is actually the volcanism or its impact, uh, because I'm thinking that it should be the chemical way, because whenever this volcanic activity happens, so it, it supplies more CO2 to the atmospheres, then develops the warming and the rain, and then the more chemical weathering happens. If the more chemical weathering happens, it supplies more nutrients. So that is my first question. And how we will tackle the this uh, the role of the continental shelf, the resuspension of those sediments while this tectonic activity is happening in uh, causing these anoxic conditions. So this is my second question. My third question is uh, that you were saying that uh, this eugenic uh, yep. sea floor was uh, higher in the around 180 million years and then 100 million years, but in the 60 million years around it is, it is less. So what causes this uh, means uh, enrichment of this sulfur? Uh, 
Yes, so I hope I understood them all correctly. So the first one uh, relates to the nutrient input from weathering um, that you would get during these kind of events. Um, and you are absolutely right. So the, um, the large igneous province does not directly, well, it has two parts. It, on the one hand, can directly influence anoxia because it also supplies nutrients directly. So some nutrients, especially trace metals, can come directly from uh, volcanism, especially if it's under the water surface, uh, which we do get with a number of large igneous provinces. On the second part is indeed the fact that it's a sort of indirect link. So you start with the CO2 addition from the large igneous province, then you get the climate change and you get nutrient input. There has been some modeling work on this and um, for the Cretaceous in particular, if I can find a map. Yeah, so for the Cretaceous, one of the ideas that people have is that the Central Atlantic is so locked in by land that nutrients would get trapped in there by circulation and remain available for a very long time. So depending on where you are, the nutrients might be the main reason why you get anoxia and organic carbon burial. In other places, it could be mostly the solubility problem or changes in circulation, but nutrients are definitely a huge, uh, play a huge role. And also for the PTM, we've done modeling for this and it's even just the the input of weathering, even if it's not super high, it starts a sort of feedback process, including the recycling of phosphorus. That is basically the final impact is what you see on the map. Uh, the second, if I remember correctly, has to do with the continental shelves and the remobilization of nutrients. Yes. Um, that is something that is still ongoing work in the sense that we recognize it happened, but we don't really have much of an idea yet on what scale and what the impact was exactly. Uh, partly because the models that we have are limited in their capacity to do that. And then we have other models that can do that part very well, but they don't do the other parts of ocean chemistry and atmosphere very well. So that's something we're still a little bit limited in um, our understanding, partly because of just methodology. And the last part, so uh, the, the oxygen, um, once it decreases, so initially when you decom decompose organic matter, you use oxygen. And then once oxygen is gone, you go through this cascade where other electron acceptors are used. And at some point, this process will start releasing sulfide. In the beginning, the sulfide will be just in the sediment. So there are situations where the water column may be more or less anoxic, but not sulfitic, and that you have sulfide in the sediment. But over time, if this keeps going for a long time, the sulfide will escape the sediment and enter the water column. In places like the Black Sea, this happens mostly in the deep ocean. In the top, it's too oxygenated, and the sulfide, I guess, will be oxidized and just not remain there. In times like the PTM and OA2, we have evidence of sulfide reaching all the way to the surface waters, where it is, of course, a poisonous gas for a lot of the organisms living there, and it makes everything so much worse. Nina, I have a cross question for this, actually. So when you are saying the sulfide is released due to the sulfate reductions by the microbes, but uh, I think that, uh, so how this uh, enrichment of this uh, Trace elements like the molybdenum, lenium, which prefers to go with the sulfide phases. So how that happens? So you mean you mean to say that the sulfide is in in that much excess that after the precipitation of this element also it remains, then it diffuses upwards to the ocean. This is your meaning. Yeah. So basically, in the sulfide is generated generally in the sediments, then it enters the water column. And for example, with molybdenum, you have dissolved molybdenum when there is oxygen. Once there is sulfide coming into contact with the molybdenum in the water column, it forms molybdenum sulfides, which are solid phases, and they are deposited in the sediment floor. And those are the things we can then measure. So we cannot measure, for example, the sulfide anymore directly. We can in the modern ocean, but for the past, we have to use these other indirect measures, like, for example, molybdenum, which um, makes it enters a sort of burial phase under sulfitic conditions. But it's it's a pretty complicated chemical process that I also don't, well, I generally understand it, but I don't know all the details of it either. And it's 
the isotopic part actually is also still work that is being refined uh, over time. Okay, sorry. Thank okay. You. okay, thank you very much. More questions? No. Okay, Nina, thank you very much. And no problem. Uh, would you like to be uh, to receive the emails about our future? Yes, sure. Okay, thank Would you very nice. much. Thank you. So I, keep you. I keep you in the loop. Okay, yes, thank, thank you very much. much. I'm sorry for the harsh beginning. No worries. <laughs> thank you for inviting me again. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.